Hello, I would like to formally introduce the tie to the Instro range. Um, perhaps a little bit of deja vu here because uh, this module exists. Um, so this is a, a limited edition module that I produced, which uh, is also called the tie, but uh, a funny story. This was never actually intended originally as a production module. Um, I actually just borrowed the name tie from uh, this working project, which was at an earlier stage of development. Um, but uh, yeah, this this came about through uh, a quirky set of circumstances. It was a, a limited run I was able to produce during COVID, um, just based on what components were available. Um, it started its life out as this guy, which was uh, just a bit of a side project I did to, I guess, celebrate completing Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Um, so yeah, I designed the module around the, the Sheikah uh, graphic that's found in the game um, and yeah, there seemed to be a bit of demand for it when people saw, saw this guy so I did a I did a run borrowed the name Ty and made a faceplate that was uh, not Nintendo IP um, but uh, yeah so the 4HP Ty this new module is uh, it's not a sequel it's not a it's not a v2 of it this is what the Ty was always intended to be so this is a, a a longer development that's been ongoing for many years. Uh, I've actually had this version production ready a couple of years back now, but uh, yeah, the, the chip shortage really uh, delayed things. But uh, yeah, very excited to show this off now and get it out into the world. Uh, so, in a nutshell, it's a, a random voltage generator, um, modulation source, clock source, clock processor. Uh, I'll give a, a brief rundown of it. Uh, this video is going to be quite extensive. There'll be a lot of uh, patch examples uh, demonstrating how the module can be used. Uh, up the top, we have an analog sample and hold. So there's an input, output. There's a built-in white noise generator, analog white noise generator, that uh, normals to the sample and hold input. Uh, there's this jack down here, which is either a clock input or a CV input. When it's a clock input, it clocks the analog sample and hold, so it can be used in more traditional analog sample and hold contexts. Um, a big component of this module is its clock processor. So you'll see there's a tap tempo button, clock input. Uh, this is uh, this is built around an algorithm that I've been developing for a good number of years now. So uh, the whole goal was it to be able to um, adapt to existing clocks and not just align and match in BPM, but also to phase align and align downbeats. Um, so this patch, for example, there's a lot going on, but fundamentally it's just this drum groove coming from the looper. So I could speed this up. And it's going to speed everything up to follow in time. So this playback loop is generating a master clock that's going to three parallel ties. They're following this BPM and generating random voltage steps, modulations, LFOs. Uh, derived from this fundamental tempo and as the tempo changes they'll adapt and they'll follow and they'll they'll keep keep in time uh, yeah it's a very uh, useful module for uh, adapting to existing patches uh, uh, what else we've got going on there is a uh, an extra random voltage generator output so the module itself is a, is a hybrid design, so there's analog components, the analog sample and hold, but uh, a lot of it is uh, digital and algorithmic. So there are, there's a collection of six different random voltage generating algorithms that I've built in that uh, produce random voltage from the random output. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be going through each of these random algorithms in detail, uh, give some patch examples for, for them independently and you know, where they might fit into a patch. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been, I've been playing with at least three of these in any rig for the past couple of years because uh, they're just extremely useful. Like you're just isolating one for use as a classic sample and hold, uh, using one as a master clock or to follow an existing clock, and other ones to just add a little bit of deviation, uh, variation, and you know deviation to more structured rhythmic elements. A lot to dig into, so I'll uh, I'll uh, stop talking now, and we'll dive into some actual patch examples showing what the the tie is capable of. Uh, hope you enjoy. Cheers. Okay, before I dig into some more uh, extensive uh, musical patch examples, I thought it might be useful to talk through the ties 
uh, clock mechanics a bit, just to give a, a bit of an overview of how, how things work, how to best control it. Uh, so I'm just going to patch from the clock output through the, the data here so we can see it. And I'm going to use this clock to ping a filter and have that audibly sound as like a, a metronome marker. Actually, what I could do, I could just uh, go a step further. Let's patch this through the knock. Uh, I'll cascade that clock signal. And let's go with more of a, a useful like kick voice. Keep it through the car and that will saturate it slightly here. Okay, let's use this envelope and I'll pitch down. There we go. A bit more of a musical kick. Uh, I'll patch the audio signal through the data as well. That way we can see the transients. There we go. Nice. Okay, tap tempo. So this is running a tempo. Uh, I've got the toggle switch in the down position, so that's it defined to straight clocks. So the clock output's going to be uh, direct four on the floor, essentially, of the BPM that I'm dialing in. Um, if I were to set this switch to the up position, then that's engaging the probabilistic clock. So it's in in parallel to the defined BPM. So we can see the BPM still going straight and we're actually getting parallel movement on our analog sample and hold. So it's internally clocked at the moment because I've got the, uh, the input jack set to CV. So it means that internal clock is going to the uh, analog sample and hold versus external clock, in which case it's no longer functioning. Uh, so we can see that we're getting a, a fixed timing BPM clocking of our random voltage source. Uh, but the rhythms coming from the clock input are, are uh, varying based on the probabilistic range that's defined by the, the fader. So I'll go back to straight. Let's just manually tap that in. Uh, I'll pull that out for just now. So you might see when I change a, you know, put in a new tap BPM, uh, there's a period where the button's blinking yellow, where it's essentially ramping up or ramping down. So there's a, by design, there's a bit of a fluid uh, adaption time between tempos. Uh, and I've, I basically just developed this and timed it to get it as feeling as natural as uh, as I could for most intended use cases of this. Um, so I found that a lot of uh, other tap tempo based devices, uh, a lot of them are just doing basic uh, delta time tracking. So if I were to tap at random, single one, the tie ignores it, whereas a lot of other tap tempos I've experienced will register that new time difference as being a really slow BPM, uh, which a lot of the times can sort of stall the clock temporarily until until you give it more information, more tempo information to then latch to. Uh, so I tried to keep this a bit more natural feeling so that if you are changing tempos, it's a, it's a natural adaptation to the, to the new BPM. So this does mean that there's a lower limit to BPM that can be tapped in with this top interface. Uh, I kind of just found found the line that I felt was most natural. So, you know, there's a, a limit practically to how long you're willing to wait between taps to define a low tempo. So it still goes pretty slow in terms of BPM. But at a certain point when you're getting into lower tempos like that, it's no longer a factor of BPM and it's more a case of uh, your know, LFO rates, um, bigger, bigger cycles. So, uh, but there is a way around that. Uh, if I were to patch an external clock, but in this case, not a steady clock, a manual clock, which is going to be coming from the time here. So this is just set to momentary. Um, 
oops, that's my pitch of the kick there. So that's me now tapping in a new tempo remotely from a, a manual manual gate source. Um, we can see that the, the ties actually got patch detection for this clock input jack. So if it's unpatched, then it's blinking white. So this way it registers, I've got a tempo running. If I patch something in, even if there's no active clock, uh, it will recognize there's a patch cable there and it's now changed the color to that off-white, uh, yellow-white mix. Um, for external clocks like this, there's actually a much lower tempo floor where uh, it will it'll be able to follow much slower tempos. There we are. So that was just a new press and it's tracked as a new delta time. So it's a much uh, lower rate. Um, because I've got this um, patch detection, I was able to reuse this button in this context. So it's got a tempo derived. Uh, let me patch my random voltage back in. And what I could actually do, I'll uh, I'll run this through a 1F, attenuate it down, and then use that as a pitch control. Give some random deviation of pitch to the to the 1047. Uh, but actually, I'll come from the. The random voltage algorithm. So you see that's a 0 to 10 volt unipolar positive random steps coming from uh, random algorithm number one. Uh, if I have this clocked, So if I now press this button while it's got a cable patched, you can see I'm actually stalling the voltage coming from the random random voltage generating algorithm. So in this case, it being algorithm one, it's just step voltage. I can I can pause that. Secondary feature of the tap button when it's externally clocked. Um, so this applies even if there's no signal on the other end of the cable. So I've got a BPM defined. As soon as I patch something in, the, the BPM doesn't skip a beat. It's, uh, it's still continuing, uh, but it's now uh, registering. It's got a patch cable there. So it's changed the mode of this, this button. So I can now freeze it like that. Okay, clock probabilities. Same thing applies. If that's patched, I can freeze the the random output, but the probabilities are still doing their thing as intended following the, the BPM. Okay, other ways of utilizing the clock. If I press and hold the button, it's going to turn the clock off. So this has just muted it. So if I want to stop the clock completely, I can just do that. If I wanted to pick back up, just give it a new tap tempo. Uh, there's an extra trick here as well. If I stall the clock, press and hold. If I change the toggle switch position, to either the up position or the down position, then I remove the the external clocking or the tap tempo feature and the toggle in the up position, this is high rate, so I've got the slowest to the fastest internal clock rate defined by the fader or switch in the down position, then this is the fastest for low rate. It's kind of like two gears and they'll go down to really slow BPM. So if you want something that's a really slow 
cycle, this is another way to do it without having to tap and wait for the delta time of that defined BPM. So a trick in this mode as well is once I've got my tempo where I want it to be, if I put the switch to the center position, uh, the fader now needs a pickup, but it will it will apply the variable parameter to uh, the currently active um, algorithm. So in this case, it's algorithm one, which is random steps, but I'm applying slew to that. So. hearing this more as a sustained sine wave oscillator. So no slew, with slew. Faster rate, slower rate. And if at any point I want to take over a game with tap tempo, tap that in and it's going to pick up where it left off. So in this case I've started that tap tempo back in while I've got the switch in the up position so it's jumped straight into the probabilistic uh, subdivisions. Between those various methods of interfacing with the the, the clock the clock mechanics, uh, there's quite a range of uh, capabilities here. Okay, onwards into more musical examples. Uh, so a core element of the tie, which is a, a feature set that um, I've been really keen to get into a, a modular environment for a while, is uh, the the clocking capabilities, so quite specifically the external clocking capabilities. Um, so I wanted uh, a module that had the ability to follow a tempo, so you could have a master clock patch it in or have it something that you manually tap in. Um, quite specifically, if it's an external clock, I wanted the ability for this module to align the BPMs, but beyond that, uh, be able to recognize where a downbeat is so that it would dynamically phase adapt and align the, the downbeats um, consistently, uh, not just matching BPMs, which is relatively straightforward to do. Um, so there are a few, there's a few patches that I've come up with that kind of depict the mechanics of this this uh, this algorithm. Uh, so I've got a, a loop running in the looper here, and this is just a drum groove from uh, it's one of the the drum loops from the uh, the sample library we produced for the V2 launch. Uh, and what I'm going to do is visualize this clock. So I've currently got the clock division set to 32 divisions. So this is giving me a good steady tempo following the the overall loop of this, uh, this groove. Um, what I'll do, I'll, I'm going to turn the uh, 1047 into a, a basic metronome. Let's just go resonance, I'll ping it and bring it into this channel here. There we go. So we've got our 4 4 click occurring. Um, okay, so what I'll do next, I'm going to take this clock and externally clock my tie with that. So we'll see, there's a few things that go on when it's blinking white this is the external the internal clock operating if I tap in a new tempo there will be a period where it's pulsing yellow when it whenever it pulses yellow this is it um, dynamically matching so if you're going to slower tempos this will be a slower process overall because there's there are longer delta times between taps but uh, the whole point of the tie is it's, it's essentially listening to this clock and looking at an averaging of delta times and also phase alignment of it. So as I tap in faster, it should be quicker to adapt to a new tempo. Um, 
There's also a, a built-in timeout when you're using manual tapping. Um, what I'll do here, I will just patch the clock from this to my metronome. So that's me just manually tapping in. Once it's picked up on that, it's going to drift because they're two independent clocks. As soon as I manually tap it, it's constantly shifting and trying to latch onto this BPM. Um, where things get more useful is if I use an external clock. You can see it's changed from being perfect white to being a sort of off-white color when it's latched onto the BPM. Uh, but quite a lot of the times it's sitting at it's sitting at yellow. It's going between sort of uh, yellow white and and yellow pulses. Um, anytime it's pulsing yellow it just means that it's it's adapting. It's uh, it's 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 changing where it's it's sitting. So let me take the clock output. I'm gonna patch that through my second channel here on the or channel four on the on the Mordax and I'll run this to my metronome. Here we go. We have the BPM being directly followed by the tie from our clock output, which we heard was rigidly steady 4-4. So now if I adjust the tempo, So not only is the tie picking up on the new BPM, but it's also adapting and aligning the downbeat so that everything matches in time. So depending on what the tempo shift is, how gradual it is, how dramatic it is, you know, th there will be a bit of waiting time while the tie is trying to figure out where the new context is. But for gradual adjustments, see I'm speeding up and it's following pretty tightly. It's managing to keep up. And as I pull it down, it automatically nudges in the lines. So where this gets particularly interesting is when we start dialing in degrees of probabilistic clock from the tie. So this external clocking, this is defining the fundamental BPM. If I change to probabilities, it's skipping occasional ones with a coin toss chance of it missing a beat. So it's throwing in this random probabilistic musical subdivision uh, selection. Uh, and this is all derived from the ties master BPM, which is in turn tied to this external clock. So even if I modulate the tempo, Okay, let's do something that's uh, a bit less metronomic. We'll unpatch this and I'm going to take my white noise source from the, from the type, change to high pass filter, and let me then use my clock signal, which is this guy. Clock this knock AR and patch that into the CV input of my channel 2 on the car and that's uh, in the function of VCA.
basic white noise based percussive hat cymbal sound. Uh, let's get some more dynamic variation to this. So I'm going to pull from my random output. This tie is currently set to algorithm one, so it's just random steps from the, the random output, uniform positive zero to ten. I can bring my pitch down. So this is running at 32 division for this loop. I can actually kick it up to 64. So overall things are going to be tighter if you're able to work with a faster, faster division. actually I'm going to pull the trigger from my knock patch that to the strike input I'll do I'm gonna swap these uh, signals over so I'll bring my drums into channel 3. I'm going to jump my channel 2 VCA source and patch that into channel 1. Drop it back down to 30 second notes. Maybe not the most typically expected uh, modular patch, but uh, in terms of clock relationship, I thought this would be a good a good reference point for how the Tai's adaptive tempo follower works with its uh, probabilistic subdivisions as well. Single clock coming from this this looper. That's the master clock is following it and then using the more stochastic clock derived from the probabilistic subdivision selection uh, that's pinging a filter which is being frequency controlled from the random steps algorithm in the tie. I'm also using the parallel bigger time clocked uh, your BPM following sampled white noise which is the same noise used for the the synthetic hat sound and I'm using that to randomly place the panning of my synthetic hat. got a couple of uh, techniques I thought would be quite cool to show in this patch example. Uh, so sound source wise I'm going to be working with the looper. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, samples loaded in that are part of the, the Instral sample library. Uh, so first one I've got this guy the same drum loop that I was using in one of the other examples in this video, which uh, might be before or after this one. We'll see. Um, okay, so I've got this being clocked. Relatively fast. Um, the other sample I've got is one of the Fender Rhodes ones. that pitched up so this is the original speed of it um, so I'm going to build a, a piece around these two samples so to start off I'll just come out of the 
box output, so I've got a mix between the two. So they're completely unrelated in terms of tempo. I've also sped up the drums a little bit, so I need to add some degree of regularity to this. So I'm going to do that with re-triggering, so I'm going to use just simple clocking to give me a degree of variation. So a technique I could do to sort of mix this up a bit is uh, simply to take my clock signal and clock a sample and hold. So in this case, this tie, I've set the jack input to be a clock and this is now clocking that analog sample and hold in time. I can then patch this to my CV of the start position. line upon the the random sampled CV being enough of a an offset that I would want for something. I guess it's bipolar so I should push the pot up slightly so it's going to be pulling it around a bit. So this is quite a typical uh, sample and hold trick for this sort of patch configuration. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to Instead of clocking my sampling hole directly, I'm going to use this clock pulse to directly clock this tie. That's tap tempo input. Okay, I'm now going to set this to strike clocks and use the clock output of the tie to re-trigger road sample. Okay, I'm going to take the rate of my external clocking down. It's in time, it's now matching up to the tempo as it's, it's followed that tempo. Um, I'll now go to random subdivisions. Okay, let's now use my sample and hold. If I set this to CV input, then my master clock is going to be affecting the analog sample and hold. I'm actually going to use my random algorithm. This is in the default 10 volts unipolar positive uh, random steps from the random algorithm number one. from using the aux and use a couple of parallel channels.
increase the tempo overall, so I'm now getting faster ratchet repeats when I'm hitting those higher uh, probability subdivisions. Okay, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to use the ties analog sample and hold on this one here, specifically as an audio process. Um, so this is a bit of a weird one. Uh, I'm going to use it as a sample and hold, as you'd expect, but my clock rate is going to be a full range analog oscillator. Okay, so this is now my Rhodes sample running through the sample and hold here. It's set to externally clock. I'm going to use the square wave from this CSL as my clock source. So you can hear as I put the frequency all the way up. Uh, this will go up to a pretty high fundamental. Uh, we might even be able to figure out what that is. Tuner. Okay, so this is out of range. Drop it an octave. Drop it another octave. Okay, so that's sitting at... Yeah, I think this is going faster than this uh, frequency tracker can go, but it's... Uh, it's getting up there. Uh, audibly, it's going to be... Uh... Okay, so back to the original octave. So that's going way up there, so... I'll find out what frequency this is in post. Maybe put it as an overlay on screen. I'll probably filter out just so I'm not really driving anyone insane that's... I can hear up to that range. Okay, let's use this as intended, as a clock. And I've put this all the way up, so I've now got this running at a fast enough clock rate that I'm resampling this audio. But it means that I can reduce my sample rate uh, in the analog domain, but without, you know, there is no anti-aliasing filter. So we're going to start hearing alias tones as, as that Nyquist frequency is approached. Sonically, it's got similar characteristics to, you know, what you'd expect from bit crushers, but because this is sample rate reduction, you can make for quite a nice resolution reduction effect, especially for cascading this and maybe run through a nice sort of low pass filter as well, so we're, we're sort of softening the aliasing tones as they come. Okay, I'm going to use this as my master clock for. This tie as well. And I've got an additional voltage signal that I can use for. out to algorithm 3 
Swap these over. So the drums on channel two and then channel one is my road sound. I'm going to send it variable CV to panning from this random algorithm. Further process my drum sound. So through this second arrow. So I have analog sample rate reduction here. Tempo following from two ties, so I'm getting random distribution of panning of my road signal. My drums I've got going into an ARA, which is doing a bit of compression and darkening. All of this fundamentally derived from a single master clock from the, from the primary drum loop. Okay, let's uh, dive into some random algorithms. Uh, we'll start with algorithm one. Uh, the way to determine what algorithm you're in is to press and hold the small LED button, uh, and that will engage the uh, algorithm animation to depict which one you're in. So six algorithms. The first three are going to show an ascending animation from big button, small button to fader. Uh, first one being yellow and then goes to white for algorithm two. Mix of yellow, white for three, four, five and six. The direction of the animation reverses. So we go from the fader LED, small LED, big LED. So that's four, five is white, six is yellow, white. Then back to one. So algorithm one is the most uh, traditional of the of the algorithms. Uh, it's just uh, stepped random. So it's going to be using a it uses a run a pseudo random number generator to, to pick new stepped voltages, um, and will act very much like a traditional sample and hold. So let's see what this looks like. Here we go. Bring the tempo up slightly. Okay, so the default state for uh, a tie um, is algorithm one and the scaling and offset being uh, full scale peak to peak, which is 10 volts, and full offset to unipolar positive. So this is generating a 0 to 10 volt unipolar, unipolar positive uh, control voltage. Um, the way that we can change the scaling and offset is to triple tap the small button when it's pulsing white on both LED buttons. Uh, the fader now becomes a scaling control. So we're going to scale that down to zero, or a lower amplitude of stepped random. Uh, if I tap the big button once, this goes to yellow, and this allows me to offset it. So if I set the fader to the middle, the big LED button will change to the yellow-white mix color, uh, and that depicts that it's perfectly bipolar. Um, one thing to note, if I offset, let's go slightly negative. So we're not fully unipolar negative, there are going to be some positive voltages uh, which will be displayed on the, the fader LED. Uh, if I then scale it down to zero, um, whatever offset you're at, it's always going to scale the output down to zero volts. Uh, this occurs because I use um, 
I'm, I'm doing the scaling in the analog domain, which uh, allowed me to retain the maximum resolution for any of the random output algorithms. Uh, but it meant that the scaling is always going to reduce it to zero. It's going to flatten down to, to zero volts. Okay, let's unattenuate this. And go full positive. Oh, and I've patched that the wrong place. Here we go. So I've got my stepped random through channel one of the data. That's going into the harmony. That's my volt proctive source going to the CSL. And I'm going to do this example with a nice subtractive patch. Sawtooth from the top oscillator through the arrow. And we'll listen to that going into the current channel. Here we go. Tap in a slightly faster tempo. So we're hearing it sort of pause on certain notes for maybe like a double, double beat. Uh, that would just be down to the range of attenuation going into the harmony. So uh, if if a voltage change isn't a high enough dramatic jump, then it it won't change outside of the uh, the quantized note. But for reference, let's uh, let's hear this going directly to volt per octave. So this is full random, 10 volts, peak to peak. Triple tap and scale it down. So I've reduced the amplitude of my output to being something a bit more melodic, but we're completely unquantized, so it's not the most uh, tuneful example. You can see it's very quick to access the scale and offset. So if this is not used for a volt proctive control, it could be filter cutoff, could be timbre, it could be anything that takes CV input, um, then very quick to dial in random steps to the, the amplitude and offset that you want. Uh, so let's go back to full peak to peak and I'll re-quantize this. Cool. Okay, so for each of the algorithms, there are at least now, there's at least one variable parameter that can be affected. Uh, on the algorithm one, when I've got the toggle in the down position, this is giving me straight clocks from the the clocking engine. That uh, also means that the fader is now affecting the variable parameter for the algorithm. So if the toggle's in the down position or center position, then the fader will apply uh, apply change to the variable parameter of the algorithm. Uh, top position, the fader takes over as the probability engine for the, the clock generator. So we'll keep this down position and let's see what's happening as I increase the fader. You see on the scope, this is applying slew to my output random signal. Before I move on, let's uh, make this a little bit more musical. I'm going to come from my clock output, patch that through channel three, let's go, and I'm going to use this clock to strike the strike the arrow. So this is using it more as a typical low pass gate. Keeps that quite plucky. That's nice. Here, we can hear as I'm increasing the slew, we're hearing this glissando glide as the uh, the now slewed variable voltage is being quantized. Put in a slower tempo so we can hear the sort of range of slew rate that we've got here. See, it's quite a natural slew, even though this is digitally generated. We've got that nice uh, logarithmic ascending and exponential decay. Okay, cool. So that's variable slew. Um, I'm going to... 
I'm going to patch in our analog sampling hold at this stage. So I'll run this through channel 4 on the scope so we can see that in action. Hold down our tempo a bit. So we can see we've got random steps in green, unipolar positive 0 to 10, and random steps from our yellow, which is the analog sample and hold sampling analog white noise. So it's uh, it's bipolar. It's maybe going to be slightly positive weighted just through the nature of random sampling of, of noise. Um, but I'm going to patch this second random voltage to filter cutoff on my ARA. This is going to give me some slight different timbre accents um, per note. So the higher the random voltage from the analog sample and hold on yellow, that's going to give us a slightly brighter low-pass gate pluck. Okay, let's change our toggle switch to the up position and listen to this with uh, clock probabilities applied. So here we're skipping certain beats and we'll be able to see there are some red clock pulses, some gaps occurring. Uh, but where there's a gap, uh, we can see we're actually getting straight clocks at the BPM to the analog sample and hold. So this, this uh, pertains to all algorithms. Uh, there will always be a, a steady BPM clock pulse to the analog sample and hold. Um, the clock probabilities are applied to the clock output, uh, but they also clock the random algorithm. So let's bring up some probabilistic options. So the fader all the way down, that's just giving a coin toss chance of a beat being skipped. But as I increase the fader, I'm opening up a wider range of available uh, faster tempo subdivisions. Uh, this includes triplet divisions in between as well. So it means I'm increasing the chance of it picking a new subdivision per beat, and it's also increasing the range of available subdivisions that are there. It's all the way up and I get these sort of chaotic flurries of notes. So the range of these is always going to be dependent upon the fundamental BPM. Dialed this in very much to give a, a nice, a nice range of set and forgettable uh, parameter levels. So it's a faster tempo. I've got the probability down quite low, and that's taking over quite nicely, I think. Okay. Let's look at our CV input now. So the CV input jack, uh, or clock input jack, uh, its use case is determined by this toggle switch. So if I put the switch up, then this is um, actually using um, this jack as an analog input clock for, for the analog sample and hold. So I could borrow from our Ty's clock output, patch that here, and I now have my analog sample and hold directly following my probabilistic clock. So you can see the yellow is following the, the green. Take that out and go back to CV. So this is the uh, internal clock taken back over the analog sample and hold. Uh, I'm going to go with manual CV. I'm going to come from this 1F down here. So the small LED button will depict polarity of CV where there's uh, an applicable parameter that can be modulated. So for parameter 1, we actually have two parameters that can be accessed. So going 0 to 5 positive CV. Then we can see this is applying SLU to our algorithm output. So this will actually sum with the the fader applied slew. So if I briefly toggle down to straight clocks, define an, an amount of slew, I can then go back up to my probabilistic clock, 
and that slew, le that slew level is now set and forget. But it will actually sum with any additional positive CV, so that's going to push the slew up to higher, higher extremes. Let's go back down, clear my slew, back up to clocks. There we go. Let's go to negative CV. see I've gone to a full negative gate and that has stalled my random voltage so it's held it's holding on on the last uh, the last value so it's a way of manually holding or automating the, the hold over over the random steps uh, but it's more than just a a binary state. If I go with zero volts, then I have a hundred percent chance, uh, probabilistic chance of it picking a new random voltage for a new random step. If I go up to or down to minus five, then this is zero percent chance of it picking a new voltage. Uh, and this is actually a dynamic range, so I can set a level of probabilistic chance, essentially like coin toss logic, of whether or not it's going to pick a new random voltage for the random algorithm. So whereas with zero volts, every new clock pulse from the tie is going to be picking a new voltage at the algorithm. So we're getting quite rapid movement melodically from this random voltage. So if I bring up my negative fader a bit, I'm decreasing the chance of it picking a new note, so I get a bit more consistency to note movement. Okay, so now I'm using negative CV to define a, a lower chance of clock pulses. I'm going to change the toggle switch to the middle position, and this is actually giving me access to both clock probabilities and slew together. So both parameters, clock probability and output slew is controlled by the fader together. This aspect, the center position of the toggle, that's going to be quite variable algorithm to algorithm how useful it is for uh, your alignment of the two parameters. But it made more sense having a three-way toggle than a two-way toggle. So. At any point, I can go in and set and forget in a minute of slew, toggle back up to probabilities. Cool, that's algorithm one. Okay, next up we have algorithm number two. So to access that, press and hold the small button and tap the big button once, and that increments on to our Pulsing animation being in white, ascending from big, small to fader LED. There we go. Uh, so algorithm two is uh, it's quite similar to algorithm one in a few ways. Uh, fundamentally, it is stepped random. Uh, it's still got the same capability of triple tap, and you've got offset and scale uh, for the random output. Um, but this stepped random has got the ability to lock lock a pattern. Um, so I'm going to patch up in much the same way. I'll go through channel one of the data here, patch that to my harmony, quantize that, send it to the CSL, which is still on the hard sync and volt octave linked. So that's given me a sort of hard synced, you know, more harmonic sawtooth wave. Put that through the arrow, and here we go. Nice. Okay, I'll do the same thing with the clock. I'll run that through channel three. I'm going to use that clock 
to strike my low pass gate. faster tempo. There we go. Okay, so unlike algorithm one, I'm in the toggling down position, straight clocks, so the fader is applied to the variable parameter for this algorithm. Um, but we don't actually hear any difference enacted quite yet, and that's because the CV input uh, is designed to receive a, a gate signal, a positive gate. There we go. I've sent a positive gate to it, and I've now locked this into repeating ostinato. Unlatch. So what you'll hear. As I adjust the fader, I'm changing I'm changing the number of steps that get repeated in the pattern. So fader all the way up, and that's the full 16 step repeating pattern that we're getting. way of being able to add in elements of regularity to random sequences or turn random steps into a sequence even. like to automate this is uh, uh, especially with the time where I've got a, a trigger or gate jack input that can toggle the latching state of the gate um, I'm going to use the output from my analog sample and hold and use that as a sort of inconsistent um, um, clock source so basically I'm relying upon there being a big enough jump from a low voltage that's zero or below to high enough to trigger the latching state to toggle. Uh, so far it's not done it on its own and I think that's because the amplitude overall is just a bit too low. Um, I'll, do, I'll patch this through through the scope so that we can see what's happening. So there will be a, a minimum threshold that this gate input's looking for for it to, to trigger. Uh, but to extend the range, I can just use a, a larger peak-to-peak -peak signal as my sampled source. There we go, so that's greatly increased the range of my yellow step voltage. So especially if I bring a, a lower step repeat number, going to get some you know backing up and sort of elements of repetition okay I'm gonna to go to a slower overall temple and I'm going to change my switch to apply probability to the clock output. So this really suits having having lower rates this algorithm in this combination. So 
So I'm getting random control from my sampled triangle wave output. Uh, and that's giving me occasional sections of repetition. And as there's uh, faster clock rates coming from the probability, it cycles through the, the repeating buffer more quickly. So I'll go to Jack. Let's go here. Okay, I'll go to just straight manual control over the step repeats. So it's cycling through this pattern of notes, but doing it at a you know, stochastic rhythm. in the center position this is going to be controlling both the step repeat count and the probabilities in parallel so the higher the probability of faster and more clock pulses the longer the repeating sequences so especially when this is randomized it's quite a lot that can be affected at one time this constant clock but I'll keep the chances of probability uh, of not probability of um, step repeats controlled from the analog sample and hold uh, what I'm going to do is add an extra little trick like this is something that's you know not unique to this patch context of course but uh, it's quite a useful stereo patching technique overall uh, I'm going to use one of the channels on my Carn, the last channel here as an attenuator. Use that to root signal, uh, CV signal into the CV pan over channel one, which is where the audio is going through. And I'm going to take a split of my raw random output. There we go. I'll patch this into my channel four attenuator. I'm going to offset my pan so that the voice is fundamentally set to the left. As I increase the CV depth, I'm adding a bit of dynamic distribution. So uh, the note spread from low to high uh, is also distributed left to right, um, which is quite reminiscent of a piano or you know, other traditional keyboard instruments where low notes on the left, high notes on the right. So we kind of get that somewhat natural sounding stereo spread. It's a, it's quite a, a nice simple way of adding a bit of space to a, a, a fundamentally monophonic voice. Let's go one step further. I'm going to add random voltage and I'll apply that to my FM input again. Adding a bit of deviation to the timbre as we go. So stepped random, giving us random notes, but with a few elements dialed in there to give us a bit more um, natural repetition. So it's not just sheer random, we're going to get some little elements repeated. So yeah, that's algorithm two. Okay, so next up we have algorithm number three, which uh, cycle on to the next one. So this is now pulsing upwards. Uh, it's the yellow-white mix. Um, so this is... Of the six algorithms, this is by far the weirdest, I think. Um, it's essentially just chaos generation um, of voltage shaping for uh, uh, 
low frequency control signals. Um, from what I remember, this this originally started out as a, a bit of reference code that I was looking at that was a completely botched attempt at uh, a digital slew generator, but it would do weird things where it would wrap around and glitch and roll over. So I used that concept as a starting point and basically rebuilt this broken slew generator and uh, just kept modifying it and tweaking it. So adding additional instabilities, some sort of direction flip coin toss logic. Uh, yeah, I, I just kept tweaking it and breaking it further until it was it was at that point where I was like, yes, this is this is broken enough. So yeah, this is the the, the chaos the chaos algorithm. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's see what it let's see what it looks like to start with. Um, I'll come up from the random output. This is still default unipolar positive zero to ten volt range, and as we can see, we're getting. Combination of some steady voltages, sometimes it'll settle, sometimes it'll drift, sometimes it'll wobble, sometimes it'll inconsistently cycle, ramping up, ramping down, you'll get these weird peaks, troughs, valleys. Um, I think the best way that I've come up with for demonstrating this sonically is just to use it to create a really chaotic, weird, rhythmic percussive patch. So I'm going to run this voltage through an attenuator on my Karn and patch out from that to the volt per octave of my CSL. So we'll hear this just as a direct pitch control and that will give us like the most immediate reference point for how this sounds. Um, I'm gonna come from the, yeah, come from the wave folder output and I'll run that through the ARA just so we've got some softening, some filtering in there. Okay, here we go. Pick up the low productive CV. I'm gonna slow this down a good bit. This this algorithm really suits lower tempos because some of the oscillation rates, some of the flutters and shapes and patterns can be a bit rapid. I find it's quite reminiscent of some of the uh, you know, early video game sound effect techniques where it was undersampled LFOs to get these sort of weird repeating patterns or steps. It's quite fun just as a weird pitch control on its own. Um, Okay, before I start to build this patch out a bit, let's let's look a bit at the sort of fundamentals of the controls of this algorithm. So we've got the toggle in the down position, so this means the fader's affecting the the variable parameter of algorithm three. Um, the way I've kind of designed it all the way down is kind of the this the stable chaotic point where it's going to do this every new clock pulse it's going to be generating something, either a random step or a flutter or a, a wobble, uh, all the way up. And we're at a more traditional stepped random. We've landed on swing somehow. As I said, chaos. Um, it's supposed to somewhat transition and crossfade to a more static you know, flip-flop between states or random steps. And as you crossfade between these, introducing degrees of random steps as we approach the, approach the chaos end, it gets weirder until we land on the the true chaotic state of it. So CV in this case, still positive. It's bipolar in nature and it essentially just sums with the fader position because it's quite a very a nice variable parameter. So this is all the way positive or positive CV, so it's basically pushed that fader up to its positive state. I'll go full negative. We're back to our default chaos state. 
So it means adding a bit of variation and deviation, you're going to get different flavours of chaos. Um, okay, let's um, build this out a bit more. I'll keep the CV positive so that I can nudge it up and get to these weird steps. Okay, I'll bring up my Volproctive depth a bit. Uh, I'm going to bring up my index, which is actually summing in my top oscillator, which is hard synced to the wavefold depth. So I'm basically getting a sum of both oscillators through a single wavefolder here. I can do it actually, just to add a bit more dynamic to it. I'll use my random steps from my analog sample node to patch that to my index input. So this will be giving me different degrees of mix between the two oscillators going into the, into the wave folder. Now to add more chaos, I'm going to turn up some FM. Slow the tempo down a bit. Snap index over my FM depth as well. So the higher the voltage applied here, the more extreme the circular FM pattern is going to be. That's pretty cool. Okay, let's uh, clock this in some way. I'm going to pull my clock output, and we'll view that through through the red channel. And I'll patch this to my low pass gate strike. Got maximum depth on this. So now we're getting these sort of like weird impulse explosions, sci-fi explosions. There we go. So this is with the fader set up to full flip flop. Okay, let's add some probability clocks into the mix. Okay, so this is with my down position variable all the way down. So this is kind of the the natural chaos state, um, but we're getting faster clock pulses that are clocking this random algorithm. I can then use external CV to push it up to you know, deviations and variations of this this chaos. Let's clock faster. think of this as controllable chaos. Um, it's quite fun for these sort of weird sound effect type patches. Quite often I'll do some more deep patches using a couple of ties both in this mode and this sort of circular FM CSL combination but I'll have one of each of these chaos algorithms going to the Volper octave so I'm getting all sorts of weird mismatches of index ratios and chaos. It ends up being very 
complex timbrally, but uh, using that as a uh, rhythmically clockable uh, random textural patterns, like adding that into into percussion voices is a uh, percussion patches is is pretty fun. <laughs> One more addition. I'll add my random CV from sample and hold to wavefold depth as well. I should hit some higher, some metallic characteristics. I'll increase the depth of that random CV to wider by self sampling the, the audio source. A weird patch. A weird algorithm. So next up we have algorithm number four, which is a, a bit more of a return to something a bit, uh, bit more predictable, a bit more uh, traditional. Uh, this is the first of the three LFO-based algorithms. Uh, so what I'll do first, I'm just going to patch my random output through channel one change over to algorithm four. So that's small button, big button, and we're now on the first of the dim dimward animated LEDs. So dimward's yellow, that's algorithm four. And already we can see on the, the output LED display and on the scope, we have a much more traditional looking waveform. Uh, so this is still unipolar positive, zero to 10 volts. Um, but yeah, this can also be Scaled and offset. In the same way. Oh, here we go. Set that to being. I'll set this to bipolar. Let's uh, let's go with bipolar for for these examples using the uh, the random output. Um, I can actually scale this up now. We can see the full range over the range of the scope. Oh, that's good. Cool. Okay. Sonically, uh, I'm going to keep this a bit more uh, straightforward. We're just going to go with a single oscillator voice, and I'm going to use the LFO to modulate the, the depth of wave folding. So we'll have a, a timbre control. Uh, I'll do all this via via the ARA, just so we've got a bit of high end roll off to keep it a bit more a bit easier on the ears. Here we go. level of wavefold depth and I'm going to patch our LFO modulation signal to wavefold CV and boot. Pretty good to start with. So as you'll see, as I tap in a new tempo, there are no there are no clicks, there are no like 
sharp edges on this LFO. Um, uh, that's because the the LFO engine I've I've uh, I've built into the 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 ties uh, fundamental smooth adaptive tap tempo following. So it means that as a new tempo is received by it, it will it will gradually adjust and adapt and latch on to both BPM and phase. If it's a regular clock, uh, the rate of the uh, the the LFO for algorithm four is directly tied to the rate of the BPM, um, and this this change in in frequency is perfectly smooth, really gradual. Okay, variable parameters. Uh, I've got the toggle in the down position, so this is straight clocked from the BPM, and I'm going to adjust the fader in this position, which is going to adjust the parameter. There we go. So we can see that over that first throw of the of the fader, it's um it's smoothly morphed from a sine wave through to a perfectly linear triangle wave. So especially on and wider depths of modulation there. It's quite dramatic the difference from perfectly linear ramps to, to sine waves. The sine wave sounds a lot more natural in terms of its pulsing. But that's that's is, you know that's always going to be very dependent upon context, patch, timbre, genre. There we go, so it's through the triangle. Triangle will then interpolate through to Sort of the wave. And you see there's a good uh, range of um, notch positions, uh, not physically uh, tactile, but uh, over the range of the pot, I've got some notches derived that uh, make it a lot easier to find these uh, perfect landing spots for geometric waveforms in between the transition interpolation points. Okay, next one up, square wave. From square, that'll interpolate through to sine wave. So this sine wave is actually, at the top of the fader, is 180 degrees inverted from the, the bottom fader sine wave. There we go, let's go to more of a bass territory. So we're getting some percussive elements added in as there's waveforms that have got sudden edges in it. Uh, let's look at the further deviation of wave shapes from the LFO. Uh, I'm going to jump to the 1F for manual CV and we'll patch CV into the input jack. So now as I'm increasing from 0 to positive 5 volts we can see we're getting further deviation of wave shapes and most notably noticeably the uh, the sawtooth ramp here is now descending versus what was our original one which is ascending so the way that I've configured this in the algorithm for receiving CV versus the primary pot position is if the fader's down and I'm adding positive CV I'm actually it's an equivalent of pushing the fader further down where there's a a mirror image for certain waveforms in a opposite order. So it means that if you 
set a DC offset to get it to a negative saw here. It means changing the polarity of the fader, I can get to the, the phase inversion of that sawtooth. Um, so there's an inverted square wave in this range as well. So this is a full positive. If I go to negative CV, that's going to push me the other direction and give me some other options. So it means that over the range of a fader, if the fader's in the middle, with CV added in, I've got quite a wide range of different uh, shapes that can be accessed um, and interpolated through. So let's make this dynamic. I'm going to patch random CV from my analog sample and hold. So every clock pulse, I'm going to be picking a different wave shape from the interpolated options. Okay, let's get this a bit more musical. I'm going to oops, malt my random step CV, patch that to the harmony, and use this as a random sequence. I've got all this going through my ARA here. So I'm going to increase the waveform depth. Got a wider range of timbres. To a slower BPM. Bring cutoff down. And I'm going to use the clock output to directly strike my low pass gate. randomized timbre movements based on the LFO shapes. Everything's tied to the same tempo. Now if I go to clock probabilities, and see the clock pulses we're getting. So I'll run this through the scope so we can see that more clearly. Uh, this is giving me the probabilistic clock patterns. Uh, they're running independent of the fundamental rate of the LFO um, for this algorithm. So we've got uh, LFO following the core BPM. Uh, probability is isolated to just the clock output. So yeah, tap tempo following LFO with uh, interpolating waveforms and smooth dynamic uh, frequency deviation. So next up we have algorithm number five, which uh, we press an old small button, tap the big button. We're now in descending white LED animation. Uh, so LFO five is very similar to LFO four um, in in many ways. So I'll just patch this up to something quite similar to what I had before. Um, this is back to five five volts per spacing. It's still bipolar. Slow it down a bit. There we go. So we have toggle in the down position. Fader is now defining the wave shape, which is. Uh, exactly the same order and behavior as uh, algorithm four. Um, so adding CV to that will do the same thing, allow you to morph through the different various geometric waveforms. Uh, I'll keep that in at the moment. Um, so there's one fundamental difference to this algorithm. Uh, to demonstrate, I'm gonna patch up a wave folder voice through the Ara. I'll use the arrow just to roll off any high end, uh, but I'm going to be using wave folding as my primary timbre. Like that. So let's patch up the LFO to my wave fold depth. So if we'll do it in tandem. I'm going to send that same LFO to my cutoff frequency as well. 
A degree of symmetry that gives us the right time I'm looking for. Cool, that's getting there. Okay, I'll slow that down. Uh, okay, so I'm going to patch up my clock output so we can see that on the on the scope. And I'm going to change to clock probabilities. So we see we're starting to get some variation in jumps and fluctuation in the fundamental rate of this LFO. So the fader all the way down for probabilities, this is giving us a chance of skipping a beat. So it's basically halving the, the rate. So we're seeing this bigger LFO cycle. Occasionally it's doubling up. Uh, so what algorithm number five does differently is the LFO rate is tied to the um, temple probabilities. So if the probability is engaged, anytime there's a subdivision picked, that subdivision is applied to immediately to the, the LFO rate. So that's why we're getting hard jumps, is it's not a dynamic sweep up and down to these, it's a very immediate, rapid change. So we're getting these fast, fast wobbles. Uh, let's get some pitch information into here. I'm going to quantize my analog sample node and send that as a random baseline. I even be able to do is use the clock pulse and additionally use the ARA more as a low pass gate. So it's giving me articulation to the start, start of each note. So here I'm just varying the CV into the uh, into the tie to vary the the LFO wave shape. We can automate that further actually. Let's uh, take a branch of our sample and hold random steps and patch that to the CV input. Rhythmically related LFO subdivisions. Uh, so instant wobble bass. With variable wave shape. So you can choose smoother 
Sound wave like wobbles or get up to more percussive wave shapes. And of course if I have the toggle in the centre position I'm controlling both wave shape and probabilities. So there ends up being a natural relationship between timbre of wave shape applied to the wave shaping and the, the probabilistic chance of a higher subdivision. Yeah, that's algorithm number five. Okay, and this brings us to our sixth and final random voltage algorithm. Um, so this is a downward pulsing with the, the yellow-white mix colour. Um, this is our last algorithm, but also the last of the LFO algorithms. Um, this has got some features that I'm I'm pretty excited about. Uh, they're all they're all based on uh, in, in this algorithm in particular, based on my go-to techniques and usage of sample and holds in in melodic patching, um, where it's uh, you know I've I've made it no secret that I tend not to use sequencers. Uh, I like the chaos that comes from sampling noise or, or using random voltages and curating them musically through quantizers. Stuff like that. So there are a few tricks that I use to get the uh, more repeatable melodic ostinatos, um, and I've done the same thing in this algorithm to. But you're trying to retain a bit of consistency, uh, where it's sometimes a bit harder to keep control of things. So let's start off. I'm going to patch my LFO through through the scope again, so we can see what's going on. Um, the default fader parameter, so this is with the toggle in the down position, this controls our wave shape. So I'm going to set this to being a, a sawtooth, because that's often quite a useful uh, source to be sampled for generating uh, rhythms and patterns. Um, sonically, we're going to keep things nice and classic. Sawtooth through a low pass filter. Here we go. Yeah, it's quite a nice resonant sound. Nice. Okay, so to do this appropriately, I think I'm going to quantize this ramp so that I've got uh, an ascending arpeggio, a uh, minor triad arpeggio. Linear LFOs tend to work best for this sort of patching technique. Here we go. Starting ascending ramp. Uh, I'm going to now jump in and run that as an LFO through a more traditional analog sample and hold. So I've just patched it from the random output to the sample and hold input and we're now viewing that. Uh, so to see this properly I'm going to need to re this at a rate that I want. So I'm going to set the CV input to be in clock input. There we go. So we can now see the downsampling of the sawtooth wave, sawtooth LFO. So as I downsample it, these new this new step voltage pattern is being quantized. So 
So it means that I can define my clock rate that I want. If I then vary the a new rate of LFO. So in this case, this is now much faster. I'm playing off this ratio. It's essentially undersampling the frequency of the LFO. So as my, you know, I'm playing off that Nyquist frequency point that I'm now adding in alias tones that are manifesting as a repeating musical ostinato um, at a, you know, a musically melodic rate. got this repeating melody that's continually cycling. It's sort of a descending, alternating dyad. If I change the frequency of my LFO, I'm fundamentally changing that ratio so that the end result of resulting melody is completely different. See, this one's not particularly musical, it's just a constantly increasing alternation. A lot of it comes down to trial and error and chance of landing on something, but then once you've got it, you can't you can't really change anything. As soon as I change the fundamental rate of my clock or the rate of the LFO, I'm in a completely different melodic uh, position. So. Which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it, it adds for a nice quick way to change things up and get a new melody, but it's quite nice being able to return to something uh, if needed. So, okay, so let's strip out the analog sample and hold situation here. We're back to just straight arpeggio and I'll take that clock out. I'm going to go back to CV input and I'm going to start applying CV modifiers over this algorithm. Okay, so this is positive CV, zero volts going up to five volts. And you can see we're getting the same result as before. So what I've actually done in this algorithm is I've added an additional sample and hold stage after the LFO. Um, by default, it's running at its highest sample rate possible. So it's generating the, the LFO as, as you'd expect. But then as I go to positive CV, I'm decreasing the sample rate of that secondary LFO. So going to positive CV is setting a, a fixed decrease in clock, free, uh, clock rate, uh, but it's still a static clock rate now of this secondary sample and hold, which is completely independent of the rate of the LFO and the rate of the tempo follower. Um, so same issue applies here. If I then change my rate of LFO, we get a very different melodic feel. Um, let's get this a bit more uh, musically articulate. I'm going to use the gate output from my harmony, use that as a main clock. Get some articulation between notes. Okay, cool. So now, the CV range is defining the rate of my additional sampling. Of course, this is all being quantized, so it's uh, there's always going to be a quantization layer there that's keeping it tonal. So that's me now landed on a descending pattern when my original ramp is actually this faster ascending ramp. But as soon as I change the rate of my LFO, I'm going to land on something completely differently. So there's one additional trick that I built in here uh, to retain a degree of consistency. 
if I bring this down to zero, if I invert this and go to negative CV, as I go from zero to negative five, there we go. I've landed on a ratio that's giving me a nice ostinato. Um, this has done the same thing. So going to negative CV has decreased the rate of my additional sample rate reduction clock of the additional sample and hold that's built in after the random output. Um, yeah, it's getting quite convoluted at this stage. But uh, what what's doing when it's negative CV applied is I'm reducing the rate of this clock, but at a mathematically specific ratio, like dynamic ratio to the fundamental LFO rate and tempo rate of the tie. So now, I can slow down my tempo and this undersampled, you know, derived melodic ostinato is retained because I've got a direct correlation between my fundamental LFO rate and my sample rate. So this is something that I've attempted to do time and again in analog, but it's a lot of the times I would write it off and, and consider it impossible because you're having to balance the fundamental rate of an LFO in conjunction to the rate of your clock frequency. So if you want to change one, you need to change the other and they need to change they need to match exactly so you need to have exponential tracking over both so both need to be Volper octave capable and both need to track very closely um, that's not an issue here because it's all digital so I've just got a mathematical ratio between between the rates and through all this I can be dynamically changing the wave shape of my LFO retaining the timing so long as that negative offset that stays as a as a static constant then that's defining my fundamental clock rate getting a swell as it's like oscillating between so this must be closer to a triangle wave yeah bang on a triangle wave so if i speed this whole thing up that bigger swell is remaining constant So a lot more consistency with this approach of undersampling modulation sources uh, to then derive melodic variations. Um, yeah, so that's the uh, that's the six algorithms.